please welcome to High Performance, Sam Hewan. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. I thought you'd talk about someone else there. Only you. Who is Only talking about you. He sounds great. Yeah. Let's start as we always do, Sam. What is, in your mind, high performance? I guess it's reaching my sort of the maximum potential of, of whatever industry you're in, but also, as a, I guess, as a human being as well. I guess it's from, um, it's an interesting one because, you know, a lot of your guests are athletes, but it's interesting that, you know, a lot, a lot of what they talk about is sort of not only the sort of physical side, but the mental side as well. Mm. Um, and I guess relating that to, to an actor is, is almost, we're, we're, we're athletes in a way, we're probably booze hounds more like but um but but you know we do we have to you know we have to sort of uh, maintain a peak performance i guess in in our field so do you see yourself as high performance because you're totally right when we have sporting people on they they see themselves as high performance there's no doubt in their minds because they have to believe that to achieve business people very different actors maybe it is different so do you consider yourself a high performance performer it, it it is a really interesting question because I guess y- years ago I probably wouldn't I you know I just think I'm kind of doing this I'm doing this for the love of it and but I, I would have never seen myself at, at in a, a a peak or a high bracket but but I guess you have to operate as I said as an actor in, in so many different fields it's not just you know learning lines it's like you know depending on the role you have to 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 um, test yourself in various ways, whether it's physically, as I said, like you have to, I don't know, get ripped or put on size or muscle or whatever, or get into the mind of a character or, I don't know, learn a skill, you know, that is um, synonymous with the character. So I guess in a way, but it's really hard to define what, you know, what, mm. what makes a successful actor, I guess. So how do you go about measuring it then, Sam? I mean, some people, I guess, might measure it through, I don't know, fame or fortune or popularity, but... Um, for me, uh, I guess um, I'm never content, probably. That's one thing to say. I'm probably my own critic. Um, so do I ever think I've done that well? Probably probably not. But in hindsight, I guess after after time, you look back and go, okay, yeah, I've, I can see where I've come from and where I've got to now. So in that sense, um, I might reward myself. But no, I never see that. I've really done that well. It's interesting that though, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people listening to this, um, they see looking at success from the outside in as as goal oriented. So they think that, you yeah. know, if I end up with a TV series, then I've achieved well. If it's as sex- successful as Outlander, I've done really well. If I end up on SES Rise of the Black Swan, even better. You know, all these marks that you've managed to hit in your career. But I, I think that it's only when you're in it that you realise it isn't really about the goals because sometimes they can leave you feeling cold. It's more about the approach, the application, and possibly the journey rather than the destination, I guess. Yeah, I mean, to coin that that phrase, isn't it? It is about the journey. And I think, you know, okay, so maybe a sportsman, you know, has the Olympics or whatever, you know, to become first, you know, to get the world record. But I guess as an actor, you know, there's there's just so much more to learn, I guess. You know, each, each character teaches you a little bit about yourself as, as, a, as well as learning about the character but also there are so many infinite avenues to understand about the human condition but also I guess in my case you know it's not just acting roles but it's oh I can become my own boss I can become an entrepreneur I can do all of these creative things which I find are rewarding so um, so yeah I guess I guess it's about the journey and I think sometimes we forget that. So can we go to the start of your journey then, Sam? Because it's a <laughs> yeah. Where is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like it's like you had quite an eclectic childhood in terms of you. Uh, you moved around a little bit. You went to different schools. Um, would you tell us a little bit about how those experiences have shaped what you do today? Yeah, I think so. I was born and brought up in Southwest Scotland, uh, in a very rural area. Uh, son of a uh, uh, my mother is an artist. Um, my dad uh, kind of disappeared off the scene very, very early on, at a very young age. So I, I wasn't really aware of him uh, growing up. And then I moved to Edinburgh as a teenager, which was sort of for me like the bright lights of the city. Uh, and I went to this kind of interesting school, which is called a Rudolf Steiner School, uh, or I think what people might know it's a Montessori. Yeah. Um, it's a very popular in Germany. It's the only kind of 
private school you can go to. But at the time, you know, my mother was, uh, you know, obviously a single parent and struggling to, to bring up two, two children. So I, fortunately, we got assisted place through the government. Uh, and I think that's probably where I learned that I wanted to become an actor. I think um, it, it's a very well-rounded education. You, you don't, it's not specifically very academic. You do a lot more, um, you study philosophy, you study astronomy, you study, you know, history, everything. But but they just give you a, a broader understanding and maybe hopefully sort of develop, develop the child's character, per se, uh, a little more. So I think at that point, I realized that I didn't need to go into, you know, a more traditional job. Um, and it just gave me a, I guess, uh, I don't know, like a, a sense of freedom that I could kind of do anything if I wanted to. I read a quote saying you were fascinated with being an actor when you were at school. Yeah. But didn't actually think you could do it. Yeah. When did that change then? When did you actually realise you can control your own destiny? Well, I was rubbish. I mean, I was absolutely useless. As an actor? As or an actor, just generally. yeah, I was terrible. <laughs> uh, and uh, who knows, probably still am. But, but I think, you know, I'd done a bit at school and I went into um, a youth theatre at the time and uh, was lucky to sort of be in some small productions. Um, but I, th I think there was always one moment. I think that I had a moment where I was in a, a play and the audience were laughing and I got, I got them, I got them and it was such a buzz. Um, they were with me and there's, and at that very moment when I was like, I stopped, I was like, oh my God, they're, they're with me, they're laughing, I've got this. Then I completely dried and didn't know where I was and lost it. But that moment was so, I guess, magical and so um, exhilarating. I thought, yeah, I think I understand this now. Um, and I guess from that point on, I, I sort of let go a bit, I think, if that makes sense, sort of didn't try so hard and, and just let let it happen, um, which I think also goes back to to maybe athletes and stuff as well. You know, you train so hard at something, but if you try too hard, you're going to fail. But if you, you sort of let yourself go, you know you've done the training, you know you've done the homework, um, then, then it works. You just... So you describe it in many ways, like that state of flow yes. that a lot of our athletes I, I, describe. Yes. So how do you as an actor go about creating the environments for you to reach that state of flow? It's so interesting. So when you're, especially in a scene, um, and I've spent so much time on Outlander recently, you know, we, you know, we shoot long days and you do scenes over and over again. So you kind of get really comfortable in a scene. Um, you know, you could shoot it maybe 20, 30 takes uh, of something. But, but in that, that moment, um, almost your mind is, is doing something else. Your body's just doing it. And, um, and I guess there comes this real uh, magic, I guess, where you're responding and reacting to what the other actors are doing and the situation and it could be anything and th it could be outside influence as well it could be you know, sound effects or it could be something that happens you don't expect but I think when you're in the moment whether you're driving a Formula One car or you're an actor or you're uh, competing you know it, it's that sort of moment where you're just allowing your body to do it and um, I guess that's where the creativity comes and the sort of uh, I know, the special special stuff we're looking for. And that is what interests me, because I think that if you are um, a Formula One driver, no one's controlling you behind the wheel of a car. Yeah. Um, if you're some kind of an athlete or even a business person, no one's really controlling those big decisions. How much freedom for flexibility do you have then as an actor? Because I've always sort of considered that in that role, you say those lines, otherwise everyone else thinks, what? Well, sorry, you said the wrong thing. Yeah. So how do you get the balance right in that and kind of learn to trust yourself? Because it, yeah. it can relate to anyone's life, not, not necessarily just being an actor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's something that I you know, struggled with for, for a number of years as a young actor, kind of thinking, what do they want to see? And yes. then trying to please whoever they were, you know, behind the camera or the audience or the, the producer or the director or, you know, whoever it was trying to, that I was auditioning for or whatever. But By the way, that's chasing the impossible, isn't it? Because you've got no idea what they actually want. It, it is. And yeah. I think it's my biggest weakness as well is that I still try to please people. And I think, you know, a, a lot of us try, maybe try to do that. But uh, ha having said that, yes, exactly. If, if you almost um, can forget about that, I think, and just allow yourself to, to be, um, then, uh, then that's, the, that's the, way, the way to success. So how do you, how do you get there? How do you get there? Uh, I think I think bravery. I think um, homework. I think um, sort of preparation, as they say, as you, you started off this podcast. But 
um, and a belief, I think, a belief in yourself. But I think belief and confidence are an interesting one because I think confidence is very important, but then um, overconfidence can obviously then lead to failure. So uh, it's something I've struggled with, you know, co confidence. And, it, and it's hard, you know, someone says, go on, be confident, you know, be, be uh, it, it, what does that mean? Um, and for me, I think confidence has come from experience. So take us back then to when you were a young man just starting out doing uh, stage work. Right. How do you get confidence then when you don't have that experience? What like what lessons did you learn at that young age that you're still using today as a more experienced actor? So I went to drama school in Scotland. Uh, it's now the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And I think, you know, again, we had a very broad classical actor um education you know from wearing tights to to fencing to shakespeare to, to whatever and i think they gave us a very broad understanding of of certain types of um or certain genres of, of acting and uh, and theater and film um so i guess that gives you a level or a base level of, of understanding um but i think honestly i think the most learning comes from actually being on the job you know um, and, and, and then again, I guess, you know, a, a belief in yourself, like uh, not getting in your own way and then going, actually, can I do this? And go, okay, let's see what happens. And I think for me, that's what I love about acting is that it's, it's like this moment before they, they roll the camera or, or you go on stage, but you don't know what's going to happen. You kind of know the guidelines, you know, the, the playing field, you know, the game is 45 minutes long or 90 minutes long, or whatever, but you don't know what's going to happen in that time period, but you just rely on your own skills and... So what's been success. the biggest learning you've had then? Wow. I don't know. Ask me in maybe 20 years, but um, I don't know. I think I'm in a very, I'm in a very uh, lucky place. I think uh, I've been lucky. I've been determined, stubborn. Um, and at the moment I have a lot of opportunity to, to do things. And I think uh, I'm enjoying that. And I think enjoyment's really important, isn't it? Like you have to enjoy what you're doing. And right now it's good, right? You're in the dream space for an actor where you can look at jobs and you might take them, you might not, you've got lots of projects on the go. Yeah. Was it good for you that you were still in your early 30s and you didn't really have much money in the bank and you, you did finish a job and had no other work and you, I think I'm right in saying you genuinely thought, well, maybe this isn't for me, maybe I need to get a proper job, so to speak? Yeah, Jake, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was, uh, God, yeah probably a lot older than you are right now, but, uh, no, but I'm still, uh, I was still, you know, in my sort of early thirties and I was um, just come back from America and, and quite interestingly, I've only just come back from America now. Then I was traveling around America by bus, going to auditions by bus, which was kind of unheard of in, in those times. Um, and just now I was there, you know, in, in a very different situation uh, and it just gave me a lot of time to reflect and look how far I've come. But, um, but yeah, I, I came back to the UK. I'd had some sort of level of success, but really was, you know, I'd signed on back onto the doll. I was working in a bar. I was trying to, you know, trying all different ways to survive. Uh, and I realized, you know, can I do this? I'm almost, well, getting closer to 40 and can I survive like this? You know, so I really was considering a, a change of career. And um, that's when Outlander uh, came knocking. It's a really good message, though, for people listening to this, because Damien, writes a lot in, in the books that he's written about the messy middle, that anything you start out on, whether it's a career or a project, mm. there's always going to be that bit where you think, actually, this thing's going to fail. But quite often, as you as you write, the success is just on the other side of that moment yeah. where people give up all too often. And I think we don't have enough resilience these days built into young people. Yeah. So they start on a path, find it's a struggle, haven't really experienced struggle in their lives up until that point and give up. Whereas the struggle is actually part of the journey you have to learn to yeah. accept, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't want to play the violin here, but I, I definitely struggled, you know, a, a lot as an actor and, um, you know, had a highs and very sort of lows as well. You know, I had, you know, bailiffs at the door and I was, you know, really struggling, um, but also great, great highs. And I think, um, I, I just think that's also grounded me. I think if I'd had success at an early age, I, I would have been a complete mess. You know, I would have been, um, probably all over the tabloids, you know, but really? I think this has given me, you know, a grounding. So what kept you going then in those dark moments? Uh, it's, it's probably pickheadedness and stupidity, but I'll say it's, I'll say it's stubbornness and, um, and drive, but yeah, I, I guess a belief and, and, uh, determination. Uh, and I guess if you stick in it long enough, your, your opposition, they're all going to fade away at some point, but, but, um, 
but yeah, I, I guess it was this belief and it was like, I actually don't want to do anything else. Like I, I want to do this. And did you do anything different? Or did you just carry on doing the same thing and eventually the success came? I think I became more experienced. I think I, it was more about the, the, the almost like the playing field. Like I, I began to know who the other players were, whether it's a casting director or a director or the, the, the building I would have to go to for the audition or I don't know. So then you start to go, okay, I get, I get now what the, the playing field is. And then in so that, that, that brings you a comfort, comfort then, and which I... brings comfort. And I think at that point, the more comfortable I am, I've realized um, the, the more than I can allow myself to, to, uh, to, to do what I do, I guess. I think there's a really good message here for people that are listening to this who find that rejection or knockbacks or struggles kind of derails them a little bit. Because when I look at someone who does what you do for a living, like you auditioned for Tron, right, in the States. Yeah. yeah. You were working in a bar at the time. Yeah, that's right. You went out to Hollywood. Yeah, he's done his research. You auditioned for Tron. Like That is a life-changing job if you get it but like that's not just another job that's a life-changing job yeah so how do you get comfortable with the fact that something that could totally change your life is in the hands of an individual and you are a hair's breadth away from landing that yeah and then how did you deal with it when you got the call to say that uh that's someone else so that situation was really interesting because i i i really what i was living in sort of north london in a you know a bed sit and um there was it was a pretty rough area and uh I really had no money. I think I'd been very ill and I was living on like one bowl of porridge a day or whatever, you know. And um, I got this call to go. They flew me to America and I got picked up by this amazing car outside and it was first class and I just never experienced this. And went to, um, I think, I can't remember which, I think it was Universal Stages and, you know, we we got into the the Tron suit and I was auditioning with, with, you know, these uh, other great actors and it was just such a... um, such a you know a a crazy experience and i think also at the time you have to finalize your contract so you know how much is at stake here you know you talk about the money at that point yes yeah so they tell you how much and so all you can see is zeros so probably not many zeros but for me it was a a huge deal so they put so much pressure on you uh and i actually remember being pretty nervous when i got there um and i sort of messed up the first take and i was i was like what do i do how do i make myself feel comfortable and stupidly like got down and did some press ups and it just like brought me into my body and just made me like, okay, I'm, I'm in control here. And, uh, and then I think it went quite well. I didn't get the job obviously, but, uh, but it, yeah, there was just a lot riding on it, but I think, yeah. So like the, and the, the sheer enormity that your life could change in that moment. Like I like the press ups example. Why was that so important to, uh, to shift your focus? It's probably because I wanted a cigarette at the time, actually. But uh, <laughs> which I don't smoke and I don't condone. But um, uh, at the time, I, I was, you know. But I think it was just more about being in control of the situation and what's happening. And um, I was kind of in my head. And uh, I think it's important for an actor, especially if you're in a scene, to, to to not be in your head, obviously, to just be reacting to the moment. So I think maybe simply, you know, raising my heart rate or pumping blood around my muscles it just made me feel more mm. physical um but i think it was also just to, uh, to give myself a time out maybe uh, so what do you do ne- so like the next time when you had a similar shot maybe it was for outlander and yeah. the auditions for that what yeah. did you do on that occasion that was different then so now i, f- I found i find in scenarios when i'm nervous when i'm about to step off the edge um of, of a scene or whatever it walks through the door and try and impress someone or, or whatever it is they, they, they instead of kind of uh rising to the occasion I, I kind of just go okay we'll just like fuck it let's just go let's yep. just see what happens just relax and it's like this weird kind of like uh internalizing it's hard to describe but yeah because there are moments especially even on outlander where i'm still like oh, you know like what's about to happen or have, have i forgotten the line or God, I can't remember something. And instead of worrying about it, I just mm. go, okay, doesn't matter. Let's just let it go. It's such a useful tool to find something, isn't it, in your life that allows you just to to feel that sense of freedom, I think, in what is, a, for you, a very unnatural environment. All the, all the crew, all the lights. You know? Yeah, and I some, sometimes I, I try to imagine I am that guy that's, you know, the, the gaffer or whatever who's just putting the lights up and thinking about his next cup of tea and, and whatever, like, you know, I try to think, it's just another day. Yeah. It's just another day in the office. 
And is it useful for you to not think that it's bigger than it is, if you know what I mean? I, I guess, I think so, yeah. You know, to not know who's watching. And I, I, I've done, obviously, theatre, which I guess is nowhere near as big as what you've done. But, um, I mean, it, for instance, I did this live Batman show, you know, in front of like you know, 20, 30,000 people, um, which, you know, had so much going on, you know, pyrotechnics and flying and fighting. And, and I think if you start to think about what could go wrong, you're just, you're, it's going to go wrong. Yeah. Um, you just have to kind of go, okay, hope that everything is going to be fine and just go for it. So when you were going through your training in youth theatre and then when you went to drama school, how much do they prepare you for this? So I understand they, they teach you about the craft of acting, mm. but how much are they teaching you about the about these moments of preparing for the big uh, for the big occasion? I suppose, um, I, su I suppose they give you the the sort of tools to cope, but you don't you don't know until you do it, right? And I think that's why sometimes I think drama schools are um, or, or youth theatre are maybe looked looked with with a bit of disdain because. They don't teach you to be an actor, I guess. You know, I think, but I think everyone has the ability to be. Um, but they give you more tools, and then I think at, the, at that point, once you've you've got all these skills, you've also then got to just forget about them. Mm. Again, it goes back to being an athlete. You know, you can practice the same long jump or technique or whatever, but ultimately, when you're doing it um, in the competition, you just have to forget about what you've learned and just do it. What? So, a question that we often ask our athletes then is one that intrigues me. In uh, the answer we'll get from yourself, Sam is. How much of your success as an actor would you attribute to the uh, the tools of acting mm -hmm. and how much of it is down to your mental preparation and the mental side of, of your performance? Yeah, that's a good question. Because muscle memory is really important. And I think uh, for an actor, you know, we have another muscle that we use. I mean, our brain is a big part of it because you, you have to learn your lines, right? So you're literally using that muscle in it it does get better it gets quicker at doing it and it's so interesting how quickly it does it um and also your body you know you say you're doing a fight scene you 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 rehearse it and always find you go to sleep and then the next day your body remembers it it's it's so interesting so i guess that's what an athlete does i'm guessing and they're training their body to do all this thing but then i guess th there is this magic something that you know it's it is not luck but it's you're just relying on everything to come together at the right time on the right day. One of the films I really enjoyed you in, SAS Rise of the Black Swan. How much preparation did you do for that role? And to what intensity did you prepare? Because I want people to understand yeah. that they see the fun, you, you feel the hard work. Yeah. So, so I guess every job is different. And I guess that's what's so fantastic. And for certain jobs, one thing will work. For a Shakespeare, you might work on the text and on your voice and on, you know, whatever it's required for that space if you're in a theater and you have to convey um, you know the language or whoever or the, or the emotions to the back back of the audience but for another job it might be you know a tv job or a film job you're going to be studying a certain martial art or, or whatever it is and for this um it, it's an interesting job because i got to work with uh, andy mcnab who people don't know he's uh, ex-special forces um i think quite highly decorated he uh, uh, he has a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, uh, some of them quite shady as well. But, um, but the most interesting part was that he considers himself as a psychopath. He believes he was born this way. And that's also the role of the character. So for me, it was about learning what that means uh, and studying McNabb himself. Um, and then there's the whole other side as well. So that's the mental side, I guess. And the other side was the physical side, like the fight scenes, uh, learning the choreography. Um, yeah, so there's that that particular role was really interesting for me because it was uh, an interesting character to play. And where do you sit on the quote that we use often on this podcast, 100% responsibility? So we talk about the power of taking responsibility for every area of your life, even the stuff that you can't control. Yeah. When you're preparing for a role... Do you relate to that? I'm a bit of a control freak in, in certain areas of my life. So, so I think with acting though, I think there's a, a weird side where I think it's important to prepare. I think I've said it before, but it, but then there's also this freedom. And I think, I, I think I'm an instinctual actor. I think I like, I think that comes from my theater background. You know, I think I like to n know what the playing field is in the text and whatever, and then just go for it. Whereas I know other actors really like to talk about what's going on in the scene. They want to hit each um, 
sort of point, uh, each arc, each graph of, of, of the scene or the story. But whereas I, I kind of don't want to know. I don't want to know what's going to happen. Right. I just want to feel my way through it. And I think um, that's what's really interesting. And I, I have a co-star on Outlander who's kind of the opposite of me. And I think it's really interesting to see how, um, how it works for different people. See, that's fascinating because that's like when we speak to athletes that are in a dressing room and they have some teammates mm. that like to play off the cuff, if you like, and some that want to know what they're going to do at certain moments. So yeah. how do you balance those uh, those two approaches to make sure the performance is still on point? Well, I think that's interesting. I'm obsessed with sport and, you know, I watch all these, you know, American football documentaries. You see them in the dressing rooms or we were just talking about rugby. I'm a big fan as well. But, um, but I, I mean, dare I say that, you know, on set, it is kind of like that because everyone has their own process. So some people, some actors need whatever influence it is. They might need time out on their own. They might need music or they might need to just, you know, shoot the shit with you. You like talk talk rubbish yeah. with each other actors just to feel, make themselves feel comfortable. Um, there's, of course, a rehearsal process or whatever. But um, I guess every every individual has their own their own way into it or their own sort of so understanding process. them is as important as delivering on your own performance isn't yeah it? yeah and I, so i think i grew up being very sensitive for whatever you can read into it, for whatever reason that is um maybe my upbringing or whatever but but i'm quite sensitive to, when i walk in a room I, I sort of feel i can gauge what the the, the atmosphere or the tone is and what certain people's energy is and i think that maybe might help me as an actor because I, in a scene or with other actors, I sort of, you're responding to what you're getting off of yeah. them. And I think being being aware to their their energy, their vibe means- I love that. Because we spoke to Maurizio Pochettino, the former Tottenham boss, he's now at PSG, just managing Lionel Messi and a few others. <laughs> yeah. And he talks about universal energy. Yeah. So he, when you meet him and he just puts his arm around you and he holds on to you for quite a long time. Wow. It, almost an uncomfortable amount of time. So he'll just have yeah. his hand here for ages. And you'd, and then when we got talking, did he say, you know, I feel that by touching someone, I can work out if they've slept well, whether they're happy with, which is a really interesting approach, I think, to elite level sport as much as anything else. Yeah, you know? uh, absolutely. I mean, you can read so much. I mean, you know, there's all those you know, acting exercises you do when you're at drama school or, or even as a youth theatre where you you know, staring in the eyes of the, of your counterpart for until someone can look doesn't look away, or, or you're just holding each other's hands, and you, or even breath work. You know, yeah. just breathing together. Like there's so much, and I think there's so much that human beings read of each other and we play off each other, but we don't even explore. Um, and it's the same in sport. You know, I guess you know you know if your your striker is about to do that run or do that. You know, he's going go to go. You just you sense it. It's, it's there's this this herd instinct, I guess. So let's just let's play a hypothetical that you walk into uh, a room and it might be a fellow actor you've got to do a scene with mm. where there is no real connection or you mm. don't feel that you get on or you share much yeah. common ground, but yeah. you've got to deliver this, yeah. this, this performance. What do you do to create that connection and build those bonds? Well, it's all fake anyway, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> TV and... That's TV, the honesty. That's the honesty we're after, by the way. I mean, the TV and film... <clears throat> There is there is definitely a, a level of, um, of of it's it's not real, right? So there there is weird. You, know, you do have actors that are very technical, and and really you don't have to be there. And I, I've acted to a tennis ball before, and and vice versa. You know, especially green screen stuff. We see big you know, future films. I I did this uh, movie with Vin Diesel, and um, you know, part of the time it wasn't him. You know, or it's just an animate object. So so there is this. Uh, fake side of it um but also actually interesting though so this morning I, I was I'm working on a new job and we had a read-through and of course now with everything going on a lot of stuff is done on on you know on, on the internet on zoom and uh and there i mean you i find you really can't read other people yeah. um there's this weird lag and no matter how good the internet is you know it's, everyone's frustrated and you can't hear what they're saying and so you're you're really not picking up on those human interactions and communications so um it, it is difficult but again i guess that goes back to being an actor you have to pretend that there is right but as, I, well i suppose part of the reason i'm asking sam is that there'll be people listening to this that where it isn't fake they might be going into a classroom or yeah. an office where they have to connect with people and i'm interested right. in what you've learned 
in uh, in your own career about what does create real connection? Yeah, so I guess you know, the audition or the interview process, right? You're going for a new job and I guess that's what actors we do a lot when we, we audition. And I suppose, I guess I just try and find some sort of connection, whether it's, I do it because I, I'll try and charm them, I guess. I try and build a, a, a rapport, whether it's hold their eye or to, to make a joke or, or put them at ease. Um, but I guess if you're getting nothing back, doesn't it come back to responsibility though? Isn't it kind of, if they're not going to take responsibility, you should take what? responsibility to create a, a connection? Yeah, yeah, or just take over, right? If they're not going to, mm. then it's your space, right? And I think then you do your thing and then get out of there and forget about it. Because I think that's one thing if we, we leave, especially in an interview situation and, and God, did I do this? Didn't I do that? You can't do that. You just have to move on. You, you go and you do your best job and, and then get out. So talking of auditions and interviews, what have you learned for dealing with rejection and setback? Because this is like a, not a daily thing, but it's probably a monthly thing for any actor. Oh, it's daily, it's daily. Is it daily? No, no, no. But um, yeah, it's so- Was really, it hard at the start? Uh, yeah, yeah, you of course. You personally? Of course, oh yeah. And you do, you know, you, you think, you know, what is it? What, why wasn't I good enough? Did I, was I not? Was my hair color wrong? Was I not muscular enough? Did I was my accent wrong? Whatever, you know, infinite possibilities are. But then actually, I've been on the other side during Outlander, the the sort of making it. I actually got to sit and audition other people, and I saw how people come in and they were nervous or excited or whatever. And and I saw actually how it never actually really came down to the performance. It was more they're just not right. They're not mm. the right person for the job. It just didn't sit right. And so. I guess in a way that takes a lot of the pressure off the interviewee, you know, it's it, in a sense, it's, it's, it's not that they did wrong. It's just that there was someone else who was more right. Yes. Yeah. It's my granny used to say, what's for you won't go by you. That's it. And I think in Great some time. ways to get that mindset is probably quite, it's probably quite useful and powerful for someone that is in quite a vulnerable position because auditioning is a, is a vulnerable thing, right? You yeah. Put yourself on the line. Yeah. And I think, you know, I look back on the jobs that I could have had, that I got close on, and oh my God, I wish I'd got that one, or I wish that had happened. But actually, I wouldn't be where I was now, and I wouldn't have carved out this this particular career. So, so do I regret anything? I don't think so. I think, yeah, I'm, I've like just you have to let it go and move on. So, what about on social media then? How do you deal with the sort of comment, like comments and commentary on? your performance yeah. from people that are not within your world, but that you're performing to. Yeah, that's a really interesting one because I guess so social media for me, you know, and for most of us, I guess, is really taken off in the past decade. I start showing my age now or whatever. But but yeah, I guess at first, you know, I threw myself into it. And then when you start to read comments or, you know, negative feedback, you know, uh, at first you take it to heart. It's like, or reading critics, you know, see people saying, you know, this person, whatever the performance was, was whatever. But I think now I've got better at it. Um, I almost don't, don't bother reading them. But it is interesting because, you know, there can be a hundred thousand great comments and one yeah. that's bad and you're like, oh God, yeah. And it, you take that to heart. But yeah, social media is something that I'm, you know, I have a sort of love-hate relationship with because I think it's great. It gives us access to people, um, which is wonderful. But also I think uh, it can also be it can be quite negative as well. And there was there was a period where you released a statement, didn't you, about, was it comments about you personally or your personal life or stuff mm. away from your acting? And you actually just said, look, this is a, I think you used the phrase like a daily, <clears throat> a daily stress or a daily anxiety for me. Yeah, yeah. That's tricky because your, your career is a career that puts you in the public domain. Yeah. And therefore people think that everyone in that public domain is, is fair game for that. So putting out a statement, will it stop it? Probably not. Does it make you feel better? Probably. Does it equip you to deal with it? I guess you can, only you can answer that. Like, do you feel better equipped for that sort of stuff now? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I guess, you know, short story was, um, you know, I guess with the rise of social media and the internet, you know, people can find out information. They can really almost have an influence on, on your personal life. And I think I'm very protective of, of my personal life. And it's just something that I've learned throughout time. But um, at that point, I sort of reached the end of kind of dealing with it. And I, I felt a statement was important because 
Um, because also sometimes people don't know what goes on. You know, we see celebrities or sports people, and, but we don't actually know what's going on in their lives. And who knows what could actually have happened to them that day or the day before or whatever. So I guess, um, I mean, it's all fake anyway. You know, I mean, look at Instagram. I mean, you know, people are just putting up, you know, what isn't, is it reality? Not really. No. Um, so I guess I wanted to be quite honest there and, and have a platform. And I knew I had a platform to do that. Um, but what was the reaction like? It, it, it was great for a short time. And of yeah. course, it, it goes back to, to what it was. But I think for me, it was important just to, to put it out there. And at least I'd said my piece and then people can take that, deal with it as, as they wish. And what it comes back to really is you only really listening to the people that matter. Yeah. So a question we often like asking our guests is, what do you look for in the people that you want in your, in your inner circle, in your group? Ah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, because I, I think personally I'm a bit of a loner or I, I have a very small group of like close friends, I think. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if the same with everyone that's sports people or whatever. I mean, I guess there's this drive and I think, I think I've put my career first throughout my whole life. So I think at times I've let personal relationships go to one side. So I think I do have a small group of friends or people who are close. Um, and I've become more guarded, I think, as, as I maybe have more success because uh, I guess there's just more to play and there's more, mm. more happening in your life that maybe you want to protect or you want to control. And I think I've got to control, but what do I look for? Um, I don't know. I guess my closest friends are people who actually know me from the longest, I guess. So what qualities do they bring to your life? Uh, comfort, I think, support. Um, understanding, uh, and and I guess um, a, an empathy, right? Someone that's been through something similar uh, or understands your situation where you're at. So I think, um, yeah, it's just uh, it, it's so important to have someone you know like that. And I think uh, you know a lot of us, a lot of us, uh, especially with suppose social media or meeting people, you know, especially on. It's hard to know what other people's agendas are. So yeah, so yeah it's, it's important to have that, that, that base. So does it take support. you time to really be you when you meet new people? And I, I suppose yes and no. I, I, think, I, I, think, uh, I think I'm approachable, but I guess uh, in the last few years, I guess I do protect myself more, yeah. So you've used that phrase a few times, Sam, around it's all fake anyway. Yeah. So how do you spot fake people? I think, I don't know, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character. I think I, f I can tell if someone's on board with you and um, if they're with How? you. Because this but, is one of the questions that we've asked, say, some of our young young athletes of, like, how, like Rio Ferdinand, for example, told mm -hmm. us that when you're in the middle of your career, it's like being in a washing machine trying to separate mm -hmm. the colours from the whites, that it's hard because everybody says yes to you. There's no restaurant that's ever closed to you. There's... Like nobody ever wow. says. I'd like to no. be like Rio Ferdinand. <laughs> Any restaurant. No. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I don't know. Maybe I'm not in that situation yet. Yeah. I still get a lot of no's. One day. Yeah. Talking of which, I want to talk to you about the importance and the power of dreaming. Because I see often you linked with big roles. You know, the James Bond, Sam Hewen link is mentioned all the time. And, I, you know, there's people placing money on it, I guess, because the odds change. And yeah. What's your relationship like with those kinds of conversations? Do you allow yourself to have those dreams? And if you do or don't, are they, is it a powerful thing? I think it's important to, to dream, isn't it? And I think it's important to aspire to, to greatness and to new goals. Um, you know, that one in particular is you know, one of many that you would, you know, you'd, you'd die for. Yeah. Um, but also I'm very aware that you know, it's more of a, a bookie's dream than, than anything. But... Um, but yeah, I think it is important for us to, to, you know, to dream big. And I think that again, going back to an athlete, you know, to, to dream of going to the Olympics, I mean, it must be, it must be everything. And, and I think that to strive for more is, is, is important. So what's your equivalent of the Olympics? Uh, James Bond. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's, what is my, it would be good though. <laughs> I mean, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't complain, but I think, I think there's also, you know, an infinite number of amazing balls out there and, as, I, as we were talking about before, it's not, for me, it's actually sort of not just about acting now. 
Uh, I have a lot of other projects and things on the go and actually finding more doors are open uh, in those fields of, 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 sort of being an entrepreneur than, than the acting world. So I'm really finding a lot of, um, I guess, uh, satisfaction from that. I can understand the men in kilts thing which is your TV show because of your upbringing and it's hilarious. I just wanted to wear a kilt. You work really well <laughs> together. And the whiskey, I can understand as well. It kind of all makes sense. I'm really interested though in, in my peak challenge that you do. Yeah. What is the driver for you to get other people fitter, stronger, healthier, happier? Yeah, so my peak challenge is a charity fundraiser I started when I went back to Scotland to start shooting Outlander. And essentially it was a social media experiment, really. I was trying to help raise money for charity. And we did that through um, selling some t-shirts and uh, sort of encouraging people to, to, you know, create a new healthy habit. And I think at that time, I was also really enjoying the outdoors in Scotland, hiking a lot, just sort of seeing new horizons, new ba- and realizing it didn't take a lot to, to just get out there and do it. And I think th- through that over a year or so, I realized that Actually, the problem was it was education that people didn't know, mm. especially the sort of demographic that I was uh, talking to at the time. You know, the, the fans. Um, there are people that maybe were desperately wanted to to get fit or to change their lifestyle, but they didn't know how and just needed that information. And and I guess that motivation. Um, and so yeah, I sort of uh, started my big challenge um, with my business partner, who I must mention, Alex Nazuri, who was just fantastic. And we went from you know maybe four or five thousand followers to I think we're about fifteen to twenty thousand now and we've raised uh, almost six thousand six million dollars for charity Um, but not only that we just have this group of people who are supportive and energetic and and this wonderful community and it's it's around the world you know people all, all across the world and they support each other and share their highs and lows and their challenges and and it and essentially they're also their victories you know they they've lost weight they found confidence they found friendship they uh, have done things they never thought they would. And I think um, it's it's giving them the power to do it. So it's not really me, it's them sort of taking control, I guess, of, of and what responsibility, been, right? And what has been the, the most effective first step that people have found helps them on that journey? It, it is taking the first step, I think. It, the first step is the hardest. Um, knowing where to start, you know, we try and give them a platform and in the, in the information. Um, and, and as soon as they take that first step, they realize it's not as hard as they thought. But then I guess also keeping keeping it uh, as a habit. And I think we've all tried it. You know, we've, I mean, God, I've tried some, you know, I've done everything. Um, you know, and you get into, you know, a couple of weeks of a workout schedule or whatever, and you give up because you're just, you get bored or you're not sure. And so I think it's about variety and yeah. about goals and about um, also you know, not giving yourself a hard time and just kind of going with it. It's a good reminder that action leads to motivation. We think so many people sit around waiting for the motivation to arrive and it never does. You've got to take take the action first of all. Yeah. It's also really powerful, I think, that we get a lot of messages from people saying, oh, your podcast has whatever, whatever to my life. And I often read them and think, no, 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 you've, you've done that. And that's the great thing about My Peak Challenge is that you're just giving people the opportunity and they're showing to you the power of community, of a sense of togetherness, of starting a journey. It's a good message for anyone listening to this, I think. It, it really is. Honestly, I'm inspired every day by them. You know, I, I literally have done nothing. I give them a platform. But to see, you know, you know, a, a, a woman who had severe mobility, uh, immobility is now able to, you know, to, to do certain exercises or, you know, a, a group of people who were quite low and you know, now created a community or, or or sharing their fears as well i think it's this great bravery in that so um yeah they inspire us every day and, and to be honest yeah it, it's it's wonderful and and i keep going back to it every day just to, to it actually keeps me motivated as well brilliant um it's time for our quick fire questions oh right okay good luck so first of all we want your three non-negotiable behaviors that you and the people around you have to buy into honesty enthusiasm and determination strong if you could go back to one period of your life sam what would it be and why i mean as as i'm you know getting older i guess uh, i mean i would love to do it all again but i wouldn't change anything i don't think i would change anything um you know there very briefly i just went through a a bereavement uh, quite recently and i guess uh, during that time, you wish, you know, God, I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd, 
spent more time with this person or, or spoken to them. But um, but I guess I guess I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. But there are moments, I guess, where we would think, God, I wish I could go back. How important is legacy to you? That's, yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Because I think, you know, as, as human beings, we all want to, to leave behind a better place. Uh, I certainly do. So I guess it is important. Uh, and I guess as an actor, you, you know, you want possibly people to look back on a performance or be able to rewatch something and go, God, that was great. So in a way, yeah, I do. I want to leave, uh, I guess, the world a better place with, with you know, some, some form of legacy that people, people uh, are, are affected by and, and brings you know, happiness to them. Would you recommend what a book, a, a podcast or a TV series that our listeners should absorb? Ooh. Well, ap- apart from your podcast, of course, there's Thanks. some great sound Thanks. bites there, mostly by, by Jake. He's uh, got some T-shirts printed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, funny uh, you should say that. <laughs> I, a book, oh, I mean, you know, I am into the outdoors and I think um, personally, right now I'm about to do a job about climbing, about uh, Everest and, you know, I read Ant Middleton's book, um, you know, I'm reading a lot of those those books. So I, even Bear Grylls, you know, I think I'm kind of inspired by those, by, by climbing stuff. Um, so I guess one of their books about summiting Everest, because I think Everest for me at the moment, uh, you know, is sort of the, the pinnacle of human uh, achievement. And finally, the last question is um, something to leave our listeners and viewers to think about based on all the experiences you've had from when you were at youth theatre to the the bad times when the auditions weren't great and the rejections were heavy to the good times where you keep on working and things, all those things you've learned along the way at the moment in your life, what would you say is the one golden rule to living a high performance life? Sleep more. Sleep is is so important and, uh, and relax, I think is the most important. You know, you, you've got it, you've got this, you've put the work in and I think uh, just let it let it happen. It's a great message. And I think from the conversation we've just had, that is the sense that maybe at the beginning, acting was a real hard work and a real job and you had to work hard at it. And the longer you've gone through, the more natural it's become, the more you've relaxed and found your flow. And it's a testament to the work you're getting now. Thank you, mate. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.